Hey guys, I'm Nito King, and before we get into Space Quest 6 proper, let's take a look at what they chose to represent it for people who didn't buy the game yet. At least they've got a neat rendition of the theme, but I don't think calling that 800 number is going to get you very far anymore. Yep, they didn't bother with a whole lot of story, although they do have a couple of new resources just for the demo. It's not all stuff completely rehashed from the game. And, most importantly, forget everything that happened in Space Quest V. We're back to being a janitor again. And I wouldn't worry too much about reading this story because you're about to see exactly the same thing happen. But at least they tell you how to use a point-and-click interface. Use icons to select functions and cursor placement to make things happen. Yeah, if I had to describe a point-and-click interface, it's exactly how I wouldn't do it. And they don't even let the theme finish. I guess I'm the only crew member who hasn't been transformed into a scoop of lemon sorbet. Maybe I should look around a little more. And here we are in the game proper. So, first thing we probably ought to do is pop on the control panel and turn down the music a bit. That's yeah, much better. And I'll go ahead and crank up the speed. And then let's save it. Or not. Guess this will be a single segment run. Well, maybe we can just find out more about the game. Yeah, they kind of redid all the buttons in the control panel. But at least it's fully voiced. So we've got the traditional icon interface that you're used to. We've got uh, eyes, hands, mouth, words, and pictures. They have a couple functions, but the eyes mainly look. This Tiberian skimmer may look intimidating, but it's seriously underpowered. And that clear steel compound cockpit is particularly vulnerable to meteorites, baryon radiation, and large insects. And Gary Owens is the narrator again. You're back in your comfy, reassuring janitorial duds. You pinch yourself to make sure this isn't all a bad dream. You run your hand enviously along the wide, bulbous lines of the gateway. Nice nacelles. Alright, that was a little fast. Let's slow it down so we can actually see what Roger is doing. It feels slightly gritty. You suppress an urge to dust it. Yeah, it's better. And there's one other cursor, the mouth cursor, which is normally for talking, but has a couple other functions. I hope I never get so far gone that I end up talking to myself like this. Arg, matey! You do your best imitation of one of the pirates of Pestulon, but it falls on deaf ears. Ahoy, matey! Anyone aboard? That's some cherry flange you've got there. I like it. No, really. Hello? Okay, fine. Be that way. 
I think that's where most of the humor comes from. But uh, most of these ships are references to stuff, but there's only one I recognize. This refueling pillar signifies parking section F8. Instead of F8, this post used to have a picture of a large cartoon mouse, but Starcon removed it after being threatened with legal action by the same company that lost its shirt on Andromeda Disney, the first amusement park on Andromeda. You won't be doing any refueling around here, bub. Not since you were caught smoking while filling the O2 tanks. It doesn't have time to support the ship and you at the same time. It's a tall, solidly built, sturdy support that simply stands there 24 hours a day and unflinchingly does its part to maintain the integrity of the ship. So what would you have in common to talk about? Hey, support tower F9. Anyway, like I was saying, there's only one of these ships that I recognize, and that's this one. Some woman driver parked her shuttle here and contaminated the whole deep ship with these acid-bleeding, multi-jawed, exoskeletal aliens, and you had a really huge mess to clean up. Just for that, Kielbasa refused to validate her parking slip. I would mess with all of them, but then this video would go on forever. Oh yeah, real smart. Let's go poking around inside a pod that's probably carrying a half dozen miniature face-hugging, saliva-dripping, face-eating, exoskeletal alien piranha things. And while we're at it, let's split up so that we're all alone and defenseless, okay? Not... Is there anyone in there that won't eat me alive if I come in? From inside, you hear a muffled, Nope. And they've all got individual responses to pretty much everything, but this is the shuttle that we need to worry about. It's a standard Starcon shuttle built for speed and maneuverability. Unfortunately, with a budget of only 550,000 buckazoids, they had to leave off certain amenities, like airtight seals, decent shields, and restrooms. Anyone alive in there? There's no answer. Not a good sign. Well, since it's a communal shuttle, we should be able to get in. If you were aiming for the shuttle hatch, you missed. But if you just wanted to inspect the hull of the shuttle for microfractures and embedded particulate matter, you were incredibly successful. Uh, this shuttle, of course, plays a part in the real game as well, and there's a lot of interesting stuff. Mostly this tank up here. This tank of emergency oxygen serves an incredibly important purpose. It ensures that the shuttle's hatch makes a neat hissing sound when it opens and closes. Unfortunately, we don't open or close the door in the demo, so you don't get to hear that, but it's in the real game. These are the seats for the pilot and navigator built of a semi-translucent gel foam that molds itself to the shape of whoever's sitting in it. The semi-transparency also makes it easier to spot loose change and crumbs that have fallen between the cushions. The shuttle closet contains an EVA suit and helmet for those infrequent repairs. And that's useful. Sorry, you can't open this closet in the demo. You'll just have to take my word for it that there's an EVA suit in there. There's nobody in the closet to talk to now that Starcon has adopted the don't ask, don't tell policy. Do you promise to be more interesting in the real game? Okay, I'm taking your silence to be a yes. And it will be. It ordinarily contains the subspace transmission relays and tachyon emitters. It's empty right now. Alright, well, let's just fly this ship out of here then. We won't be sitting in these seats. At least, not in the demo. 
Yeah, well, there's only one thing in this shuttle that's actually useful in the demo, and that's this tiny glove compartment right here. There's some stuff we can use. There's a roll of duct tape in here. You can never have too much of that. All right, a pair of lightweight octaminium pliers. I'll just be taking these. After I try talking to them. It's self-adhesive. I don't really need to lick it. Hello. I guess these pliers are non-repliers. A janitor never runs out of uses for duct tape. I'll just help myself to this roll. Surely no one will miss these pliers, since everyone around here is busy being lemon sorbet. You won't need any monolith burger wrappers or empty cups. The shipwide recycling program was disposed of. Don't be a garbage mouth. And we can also look in our pockets where our inventory is stored and do stuff with the items there. That's my roll of duct tape. This pair of Starcon pliers cost 545 buckazoids. It feels thick and sticky enough to seal leaks, insulate against electricity. It doesn't really do that in real life. That's just a hint for the game. I guess they do ply properly. It's always a good idea to make sure your equipment works. That's what she said. Anyway, we're done in here. Now we need to get out of the parking lot, and the way to do that is that tiny thing on the back wall there. There are composts like these scattered throughout the shuttle bay, so you never have to walk too far from where you parked. In order to avoid confusion, the compost only responds to tactile input. And this is pretty much your main way of moving around the ship, both in the demo and the real game. You can see intraship transport there, but there's other stuff you can do. No communications, and I don't think that works in the real game either. And there's the cyber functions. Can't get to cyberspace from here, even though they've got the cyberjack up in the corner there. I always kind of wondered about that. You display your standard blank stare, but it is unimpressed. You display... You display... You display your... You know, I was kind of hoping I could look at anything here. Anyway, the database is where the important information is. We'll skip the entity database for now. Read up on hollow joints. And I'm not going to waste your time by sitting here for long enough for you to read everything. If you want to read these screens, just go ahead and pause. But it goes into this whole spiel about how the hollow joint creates things that you can't take out of the room. But in the real game, where you go into the hollow joint, you can't make anything anyway, so it really doesn't matter. And the food replicator, which only works in the demo. Completely non-useful. And then the science database doesn't have a lot in it. There's current medical issues, which is just a paid advertisement. Again, pause if you want to read any of these particular screens. Although here's an interesting one. It mentions balloon angioplasty, which is a hint for the real game. And it also mentions lithotripsy, which is not particularly a hint for the real game. It's an expensive call. And the periodic table. Here's a copy of the periodic table with the real game, which is important. Then there's the entity database, which is the source of a ton of great humor. DNA sequencing... You do that in the real game, but you don't have to do it in the demo. And then the known races. The demo actually contains the entire database from the full game. And you can read up on a bunch of different species that have appeared earlier in the game. The big dealers... I believe this is the species 
of the, uh, I don't know whether it was Tiny, if Tiny's used spaceships, or the guy that ran Droids BS, but anyway. The one that you need to read for the demo is the Bjorn. Because as you can see, they're the half-humanoid, half-kitchen appliance creatures that we saw in the opening story. And a parody of the Borg from Star Trek, obviously. Although they travel in an Asherian cube. And the leader is the guy with a toaster on his head and a socket below that. He's up on the bridge right now. And this whole thing is basically just a hint to what you need to do to defeat him. Except for this last page. They've got a code for the food replicator over there. Which tells you how to create the Borg's favorite or the Bjorn's favorite food. Naturally, that's going to be important. And I could go through a couple of other entries. There's some really interesting stuff, like the Labion Terror Beast is actually afraid of you. That's why it's called the Terror Beast. But for right now, we don't want to go to the bridge and face the Bjorn just yet. Let's head to Roger's quarters and regroup. And this place is full of references to earlier Space Quest games. The closet isn't worth opening. Everything that used to be inside is scattered around the room. Let's go ahead and take a look at some of this stuff. This table is supposed to be used for paperwork and gracious dining. Since you do neither, you've found it makes a great place to stash all this junk you've collected over the years. Say it's the old hint book you found in the bargain bin at the software store in Space Quest 4. That sounds useful. You won't need that hint book. You've already won Space Quest 4. Oh. It's your old Labion Terror Beast mating whistle from Space Quest 2. You won't be needing the whistle. This table is supposed to since. Ooh, it's your old auto bucks card from your shopping spree at the Galaxy Galleria after you save the latex babes from that hideous sea slug in Space Quest 4. It's expired, unfortunately, but then you don't need much money aboard the deep ship. Wow, it's the old translating gadget you used to communicate with the subterranean alien back on the planet Corona in Space Quest 1. Too bad they don't make those little dilithium watch batteries anymore. Don't bother with it. The batteries are dead, and there's no alien language here to translate. Whoa, it's the star generator remote control you found aboard the Serian ship during Space Quest 1. Unless there happens to be a star generator in the immediate vicinity, this remote won't be of any use to you whatsoever. And there isn't, so there won't. Hey, it's the pocket pal terminal you filched from an abandoned land speeder on Xenon during Space Quest 4. This table is supposed to sit. Yeah, the cigar is almost impossible to click on. This table is. It's a discarded cigar stub from the Galaxy Galleria in Space Quest 4. That cigar butt is a piece of your history. You would no sooner carry it around than you would your golden mop. He means this golden mop. Holy cow! It's your golden mop award for your feats of daring do in Space Quest 1. That mop is a piece of your history. You would no sooner carry it around than you would your cigar butt. Hey, here's that pack of matches you stole from the Eulens Flats bar. When you return to Space Quest 1 during the time travel sequence in Space Quest 4. You've long since used up all the matches in this book. The cover is lying around as a souvenir. And I think that last thing is the decoder ring. I'm not even going to try. These are your boots. Wait a second, you're already wearing your boots. Hmm. Leave them where they are. They're positioned just right for making it appear as though you simply dissolved into your bed. 
It's a medical reference of janitor-specific ailments. Diseases of the janitalia. <laughs> Now's no time to catch up on your reading. You have a race of aliens to defeat. No big deal. Sure, go ahead, grab that red-hot spike of quartz, so it'll fuse your hand permanently to the heater. There's no gratuitous gross death in this demo. You'll have to wait for the real game. I remember he said that. We didn't make this game just so you could crawl into bed and go back to sleep. Be productive. Alright, well, let's dig in the garbage then. Feels clean for once. I think he's talking about the kitchen. You would offer to play hide-and-seek with the cockroaches, but you are always it. Once upon a time, you really meant something to me. You were a symbol of my bravery, of my importance to Starcon. Now you're just a constant reminder of the glory that once was mine, and how I'm now just a faceless cog in the great gears of the Federation. Talking to stuff is always fun. Hey, translate this. Hold it right there. Anyway, I see a food replicator in Roger's kitchen. Ew, I don't think it's working. Don't try to get anything out of this machine. You'll only succeed in getting your fingers stuck to the replicator. Again. I guess I'll have to find a different one. The only thing I need in this room is over there on the nightstand. This is your old clap master. It can turn a plug on and off with a clap of the hands. And there are a lot of plugs in this room, mostly for space quests 1, 2, 3, and 4. But not 5, notably. Let's go ahead and grab that clap master then. You yank on the clap master's cord till it pops out of the wall and you shove it all into your pocket. Well, I've got my Clapmaster, which appears intact except for a pin that's missing from the plug. When the Clapmaster is working, it's a convenient way to turn your lights on and off by clapping your hands. Or whenever a freighter warps by. Or when I cough. Pressing, pushing, prodding doesn't help. Maybe it's because one of the pins from the plug is gone. Well, let's see. It looks like it's still stuck in the outlet there. There's a single prong from the Clapmaster's plug embedded in the outlet. Alright, I'll just grab it. I thought he said no gratuitous gross death. But this game brings in the try again, so you don't have to worry about saving constantly. Come out of there. I'm afraid I'll get a shock if I touch you. It never works. What we need to do is use a tool. I didn't even let my digits probe in that. I used pliers, but we need to insulate it. I think I'll try imitating some of the smarter maintenance engineers I've observed through the years and wrap the duct tape around the pliers handles. I repeat, don't try this at home. It doesn't work. I think wrapping the aluminum pliers with duct tape makes them relatively safe for handling live electrical components. It doesn't. Yep. Even with the tape wrapped around the pliers' handles, they still ply properly. But we can use it in the game to get the pin. I think this is one of the pins from the Clapmaster's plug. Ain't she, Ain't she a beaut? Cool. I, I didn't think that would work. Go figure. Gosh. I guess I've proven that I have the ability to be more than just a mediocre janitor. I could also be a mediocre electrician. I think I have it fixed. I guess pushing and prodding it isn't going to make it any better. I guess it's as repaired as it's going to get. Indeed, it works properly, but... It probably seemed like a good idea to you at one time. You glance in the mirror. For a moment, you can almost see a silk-clad brunette overacting in a stone tower. Mother! Mother, come quick! 
King's Quest 6 reference. They make fun of a lot of King's Quest. Why don't you look into that facing thing? I have no idea what that was about. So, let's get the heck out of this bedroom. Those boots aren't made for talking, I guess. You have apparently mistaken your space heater for some other space heater that gives a damn. It's way too late to save this plant by talking to it. Alright, this video is going to go on forever if I don't move on. Yeah, we're going to need to go to the 8 rear, which I believe is a reference to the 10 front from one of the Star Trek series. I barely know the original series. Hey, it's Mr. Soylent! This is 8 rear, the ship's lounge. Here crew members come to relax, drink, eat, converse, party, hit on each other, brawl, hurl, pass out, and intrude on each other's personal space. Right now, it smells vaguely lemony. I don't see any lemon this sorbet. This new lets eight rear patrons watch the subspace transmissions of Major League Hairball games, Monday Night Bunion Ball, and the occasional pay-per-view Orat fights. I'd better not mess with it. I'll be the one who has to clean it later anyway, so I may as well save myself some work. You lick a little dust off the screen. Mmm. Tangy. Like I said, sometimes the mouth is used for stuff other than talking. Which is the most interesting part, I a think. A peaceful panorama of light, color, and limitless black space drifts quietly by the window. The infinite flow and ebb of matter and energy dancing around itself in a never-ending light show of creation. I want to see something blow up. The quadruple-thick plasto-steel window is cold to the touch. You give the window a lick and a promise. Replicator. Replicator, make me something to eat. Nothing happens. This is no fairy tale. A friendly Mr. Soylent food replicator stands in wait to serve anyone who wants a snack. Technically, these aren't replicators. They're wormholes into the restaurant universe. But the food still tastes replicated because the chefs in the restaurant universe are mostly ex-monolith burger employees and know nothing about food. Yeah, let's go ahead and get some food, then. This world's a great big ball of dirt with 50 billion souls Who like to sit around and veg down in the dark like moles but me, I'm just the kind of girl who loves the open air And bits of unburned hydrocarbons blowing through my hair You soil it clear at last a tear with clearly better taste Less people too, like me and you, and less we processed waste More hearty crunch for snacks or lunch, it's crystal clear to see You soil it clear the last frontier for folks like you I just want it known I didn't do anything to the audio there. That's the actual game audio. I love it. Let's go ahead and put in that number that we got from the compost for the Bjorn's favorite food. Here we go. You. Mmm, a jiggling, fragrant, lumpy mass of Bjorn Chow. There's nothing else like it in the universe, thank goodness. Are you trying to talk to that mess? No, I was trying to eat it. You can't look at it while I'm still here. You leave a greasy smudge on the screen. One of these days, you'll have to wash out that little screen cleaner pad you've been using for the past few months. It feels slightly gritty. You suppress an urge to dust it. Excellent guess, Kreskin. Wrong, but excellent. It probably seemed like a good idea to you at one time. Let's take a look at this Bjorn Chow. Mmm, 
freshly replicated Bjorn chow, chock full of nuts and bolts. And I thought my eating habits were bad. I guess there's nothing useful in there. I guess that's no surprise. That stuff is seriously gross. But who cares? It's the Bjorn who's got to like it. And we now have everything we need to deal with him. We've got a way to turn him off. And we've got a way to distract him. So let's head to the bridge. And poke around a little bit, since you don't get much chance to do this in the real game. This appears to be the head Bjorn. He's either draining energy from the pattern buffers, or absorbing all the information stored in the computer by bombarding it with nucleonic radiation. I hate it when that happens. There's a curious socket of some sort just below the toaster mounted on his head. That's Commander Keelboss's command center. No, wait. It's his scratching post. No, it's his command center. Scratching post. Wait, kids, don't fight. It's both. Feels plush and comfy. Maybe if you get to be a captain again someday, you'll get a nice scratching post command center like this one. Yeah, and you'll be on the cover of JQ. All fleas abandon ship. All fleas abandon ship. With these controls, Commander Kielbasa can override navigational subsystems, access ship-wide computer functions, perform sensor sweeps, and get to level six of Super Nunzio World. What are you going to do, play more dull combat? Computer, what's the airspeed velocity of a laden swallow? African or European? I don't know. It's Commander Kilbasa, and he's melting, melting. Oh, what a world, what a world. I guess I shouldn't pick up the scoop of Commander Sorbet. He'll only melt faster. Well, then let's just go ahead and eat him. Just so you know, I think you make a lousy commander. You're impatient, rough, rude, crude, and barely housebroken. I like you much better as Sorbet. This way, you're pleasant and lemony, with no aftertaste and just a hint of mint. I hope you don't remember any of what I said when and if I rescue you. Yeah, one more thing I definitely have to look at. It's Commander Kielbasa's kitty litter box. This is where he makes most of his best command decisions. Not to mention all of his log entries. Ew. Not on a bet. Attention litter box. This is Roger Wilco. Do you read me? Yeah, you can look at a lot more of the command stations and mess with stuff. The main view screen is filled with stars and distant galaxies, representing untold scores of civilizations and a vast amount of untapped knowledge that could reshape the way we think of time and space. But more importantly, you're proud to notice that your new squeegee didn't leave any streaks. Well, let's get down to business here. We'll plug the Bjorn into this thing. Excellent guess, Kreskin. Wrong, but excellent. Or not. I guess we got to plug it into the outlet here. Somebody provided a power socket here. How thoughtful. How convenient. My highly developed instincts for self-preservation prevent me from foolishly sticking my fingers in the socket. What are you trying to do? Kill me? Yeah? I hate you. You're just a dumb socket. Oh. That's a good outlet for my emotions. With these controls, Commander Kielbasa can adjust the elevation, tilt, rotation, and firmness level of his command center. And if you put in a quarter, it'll massage 320 different acupressure points. Yeah, you rearrange the commander's chair, and he'll rearrange you. 
Rotate 60 degrees. Tilt forward 22 degrees. Hard to starboard. Evasive maneuvers. Apparently, the command center only responds to kill bosses commands. Yeah, who cares? We just need to plug this thing in. And then plug it into the Bjorn. Clapping at the plugged in Flatmaster doesn't seem to help. Perhaps I've got to plug the other end into something first. Ah, he's too far for the cord to reach, so we need to get him over here. And there we go. The Bjorn in his death throes has disgorged toast. Mucho grosso. Yes! I've successfully turned off the Bjorn by plugging him into... Well, you obviously know how I did it. He's beyond hearing. Or eating. Or even assimilating. I don't like dry toast. Now, if I could only find one of those yummy Soylent brand muffins... Guess I won't need the toast. It has no power here. All right, it's his super cool lemon sorbet bioconverter belt. Got to try that on. You don't need to wear it, you just need to use it. Oh, yeah. All right, I got his belt. I hope this guy, or whatever it is, isn't going to be too ticked off at me for taking it. I'll just give this lemon sorbet bioconverter button on the Bjorn belt a push and see what happens. All right, the belt begins to thrum with electronic life. I've saved all my fellow crew members from cleansing the pallets of the Bjorn. I wonder what incredible adventures lie in store for me and the crew of the Deep Ship 86 and Space Quest 6. Well, we'll be finding that out in the next video where I start playing Space Quest 6 for real. Stay tuned, and I'll see you guys then. It will be awesome.